Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first webinar of the World Bank KDI School monthly webinar series. My name is Yeonji Kim from the KDI School of Public Policy and Management, and I'll serve as your MC for today's webinar. Before we get started, <clears throat> please note that today's webinar will be recorded for knowledge sharing purposes. The recording will also be uploaded later to the KDI School's official YouTube channel. This webinar is our new joint venture with the World Bank, where experts from the bank will share their recent findings with the school community. We hope you gain exclusive insights into the cutting edge research by the bank and have time to reflect on possible applications. During the presentation, please keep your microphone muted. If you have any questions or comments, please wait for the Q&A session or leave your messages in the chat. Now, I'm pleased to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Franz Roth. He's a senior economist in the World Bank's Fiscal Policy Unit. His work has focused on fiscal and monetary policy. Prior to join joining the World Bank, Dr. Roch was an economist at the South African Reserve Bank, where he contributed to the bank's forecasting, macroeconomic modeling, and the monetary policy report. He holds a master from Oxford University and a PhD from the University of Stellenbosch. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Franz Roch. Dr. Roch, please share your slides when you're ready to begin. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me share. Okay, so uh, yeah, so today I'll be presenting on how do rising US interest rates affect emerging and developing economies. Um, this is joint work with Carlos Arterta, who's the practice manager um, who runs the Global Economic Prospects Report, as well as Steve Kamen. And Steve Kamen is a former Fed official. Uh, he was director of the uh, International Division for International Finance at the Fed. Um, and um, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Jiayu Fan, who helped us with uh, research assistance. And obviously, this is all our work and shouldn't be attributed to uh, the World Bank. So the paper I'm going to present today uh, is exists in two forms. So you can go check it out at the in the June 2023 Global Economic Prospects Report, as well as a policy research working paper that we published in December 2022. Uh, with the same name uh, as this uh, seminar. So the motivation for this work is really about the environment we saw in 2022. Inflation shot up substantially throughout the world uh, and was le at levels not seen for decades. Uh, and as a consequence, we saw a rapid rise in interest rates, both in the United States, as well as throughout the world. Uh, and that rapid rise in interest rates really poses a significant threat to emerging markets and developing economies, uh, or at least the orderly running and macroeconomic conditions uh, in those economies, especially in a high debt world that we find ourselves in currently. And so the purpose of the study is really to explore the impact of these U.S. interest rate shocks. And while there's lots of literature that covers this kind of topic, uh, we felt like we could say something new and something useful. Uh, and it's also important to understand the context we found ourselves in uh, in 2022. Uh, on the left chart, you can see uh, PCE inflation, personal consumption expenditure inflation in the United States and its evolution since 1975. Uh, and what you can quite clearly see, and I hope some of you have paid attention to this, uh, is the substantial rise in prices and in inflation we saw in the United States. PC inflation went up to something like 7% uh, at its peak. And this charts, these charts end in, in May and in basically middle of 2023. So the more recent uh, information is not included here. Uh, but quite clearly, this was a substantial shock relative to the 
decades prior. You, you can see in that chart on the left that we didn't see inflation rates like this uh, since the early 1980s. And then, of course, in response to this, the Fed hiked policy. Uh, and on the chart on the right, you can see the cumulative path that the Fed took in 2022. That's the slightly darker uh, path there um, in, the, in the chart. Uh, and uh, the chart on the right gives us, in, gives us in context of other hiking cycles that the Fed undertook. Uh, so what you can see quite clearly is only since the 1980s, did we see something as sharp and as steep as the hiking cycle that the Fed undertook in 2022? Uh, another uh, interesting hiking cycle, which uh, maybe you guys were aware of and saw, was what happened in 2015, right? So the Fed, uh, in response to the global financial crisis in 2008, dropped interest rates uh, to zero and then started quantitative easing. That's the buying of bonds, uh, of US Treasury bonds by the Fed. Uh, and only by 2015 was it able to unwind the uh, stimulus that it provided through uh, much of the basically six years uh, between 2009 and, uh, and 2015. Uh, and quite clearly that uh, path took substantially longer, easily twice as long and the hiking cycle was substantially less steep uh, in 2015 relative to 2022. So 2022 reflected a, a, a significant change in the macroeconomic conditions that we've seen. Uh, and I'm guessing most of you are on the younger side who are students. Uh, so anything that you've seen since basically since you were born. So I'm gonna address three questions uh, in this presentation. I'm gonna uh, ask the question uh, and answer the question of how have real inflation and reaction shocks driven changes in US interest rates in recent years? And I'll explain what those shocks are and what they mean. Uh, we're gonna ask how do different types of shocks affect EMDEs? The World Bank of course is a development bank. So its main objective is developing economies. And I'm going to be using this EMDE reference throughout the presentation. Uh, and that really stands for Emerging Market and Developing Economy. So try to keep that in the back of your heads. Uh, so how do these different types of, effects, uh, uh, types of shocks affect emerging markets, financial markets, uh, capital flows, borrowing costs, and fiscal outcomes? And then how do different types of shocks affect the likelihood of financial crises uh, in uh, EMDEs. So on the first question, uh, we decompose U.S. real interest, uh, U.S. interest rates, uh, specifically the two-year yield, bond yield, into three shocks. Uh, and this is uh, the basic logic of this is something like if you were to think about a, a central bank that is responding to developments in the macro economy, uh, it's likely, if it's an inflation targeter, likely doing something like the Taylor rule, right? It is responding uh, from uh, raising its interest rates in response to of deviations of inflation from its target uh, and of how far unemployment is from some equilibrium value or from let's say some normal value um, or how big the output gap uh, is. And this logic of the Taylor rule is basically the three sort of things that we're trying to decompose. So uh, the Fed would raise interest rates if it uh, saw real shocks, right? Or interest rates would rise if it saw real shocks. These are effectively the output gap or unemployment uh, part of the Taylor rule. And this is reflecting these improved US economic uh, prospects. Uh, it could also raise its interest rates because of inflation shocks, right? Uh, so its main mandate is to control inflation and control prices. And so if prices deviate from its target, which uh, is about 2% uh, on PCE inflation, uh, then that shift away, inflation shift away from its target would require interest rates to rise um, to bring inflation back to its target. So this inflation shocks is really reflecting these rising uh, inflation expectations. 
And then uh, finally, uh, we're going to decompose it into reaction shocks. And this is really reflecting the market's assessment uh, of the Fed's reaction function. And that, that assessment has become more hawkish uh, or more dovish. So more aggressive to fighting inflation uh, or less aggressive to in fighting inflation. So if you were to think about it in the Taylor rule context, you're talking about uh, really the coefficient uh, in the equation that the Fed places on uh, how fast it wants to get inflation um, back to its target or how aggressive it wants to breed to bring inflation back to its target. So these are the three shocks that we're going to try to um, decompose and find and then use that to try to tell a story of what we saw during the COVID crisis as well as uh, during the hiking cycle of 2022 and uh, another notable case. So how do we do this? Uh, well, we basically um, run a Bayesian VAR with stochastic volatility. Uh, and so I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with this kind of uh, work. Uh, it's not important uh, in, in, in many, in, in the sense, uh, all you got to know is really the intuition of those shocks. So uh, for those who are more interested in this, um, we're obviously doing a vector autoregressive model. We're doing it on four variables, both the two and 10 year uh, US bond yields, uh, the S&P 500 equity price, as well as inflation expectations. And these are five year ahead inflation expectations. We're gonna run this model from January, 1982 to about September, 2022. We've updated it. Uh, for example, in that uh, Global Economic Prospects chapter to May of 2023. And how we're going to define these reaction real and inflation shocks is we're going to use sign restrictions. And so all this does is we're going to tell, we're going to ask the model to find us a shock, right? Uh, and a shock here is basically the idea is we're trying to find the exogenous part of policy, right? If you were to think of the reaction shock, we want to know what is actually um, driven by uh, exogenous policy changes um, or uh, that the Fed is undertaking. Uh, so that reaction shock, we're going to say, uh, occurs when you see a rise in yields, but a decrease in equity prices and a decrease uh, in inflation expectations. On the other hand, if we see uh, all three of those variables or four of those variables, let's just think about yields as the same thing, two and 10 years, all of those variables are rising at the same time, that likely reflects uh, a real shock, right? The economy is improving, equity prices are rising, inflation expectations are rising, and the Fed is increasing interest rates as a consequence uh, in response to those uh, improved conditions. Or uh, if you were to think about it from the market perspective, the market is, uh, is raising interest rates on two-year yields uh, in response to, uh, or in an, an expectation that the Fed will respond to this positive uh, real shocks by raising interest rates. And then finally, in an inflation shock, we think of as raising interest rates uh, and inflation expectations, but being negative uh, or bad for uh, equity prices. And so we're going to use the behavior of these uh, variables to try to disentangle these real reaction and inflation shocks, and then look at how, of course, they impact on uh, developing economies. So this is uh, an historical decomposition basically from the model. Uh, and we're going to be looking at uh, a few notable uh, events that happened uh, over the last decade, let's say, um, uh, at the uh, as a consequence of Fed uh, policy. Uh, and one of those that happened in 2013, uh, and I'm sure, again, if you guys are all graduate students, quite young, this is well beyond uh, when you were paying attention to any of this stuff. But basically, in 2013, uh, there was the taper tantrum. Uh, and hopefully you've heard about this, but uh, what happened was that the chairman at the time, Ben Bernanke, uh, the Fed had implemented quantitative easing. It had implement, implemented three rounds of quantitative easing. Uh, the, the global financial crisis happened in 2009. Uh, the economy slowed significantly. 
The Fed needed to provide stimulus uh, to counteract that slowdown, to be countercyclical, to achieve its mandate. Uh, and it was effectively ran out of space with interest rates and as a consequence had to do unconventional monetary policy, and that's to buy bonds. So long-term U.S. Treasury bonds, uh, basically to bring down the, the, the you know, uh, farther end, the longer end of the yield curve. Uh, and um, it, as it went to the third round, uh, by 2013, it was thinking that it started needed to start moving out of this uh, policy. Uh, and so Ben Bernanke hinted at the fact that they were likely to start tapering asset purchases as part of this QE3 program. And in response, uh, uh, bond yields rose significantly. Uh, the U.S. 10-year Treasury bond yield, which is what I'm showing in this chart here, rose by about one percentage point. And that's a very significant move uh, in the context of, of, of bond uh, moves. And you can see over um, the May 2013, when the announcement kind of happened, over the next couple of months, how those bond yields rose, those 10-year bond yields. Uh, and a big part of that was really a shift in the market's perception of the Fed, right? A more hawkish shift in the market's perception of the Fed. Uh, and that also happened, of course, in the context of a better uh, economic outlook. So better real shocks, more positive real shocks, which you see in those uh, orange bars. Of course, uh, a very uh, important uh, event uh, in everybody's life, which I guarantee you guys were probably very aware of, uh, was the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this chart then shows the exact same decomposition of now we're looking at the two-year um, bond yields, not the 10-year as in the previous case, right? Taper tantrum was all about the long end of the yield curve. So it was uh, the act, all the action was in the 10-year yield. Um, but in, in this case, we're looking at the two-year yield. So how did uh, two-year yields move as a consequence uh, of COVID? And what you can see in that first shaded area uh, and in the green line is really the decrease in two-year bond yields to the zero lower bound, right? That happened pretty quickly, uh, basically uh, within uh, two months, uh, policy rates were back at the zero lower bound. And two-year yields reflected that and also went uh, down uh, significantly by about 150 basis points. That first shaded area shows you when COVID hit and the substantial negative real shock uh, that hit uh, and drove these yields down as a consequence of the lockdowns we saw, uh, as well as, um, uh, you know, sort of the freezing of economic activity as a consequence uh, of COVID. And over time, uh, you can see sort of how these shocks evolve through uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, an important sort of thing to look at is how these are cumulative shocks here that I'm showing. So what I'm doing is I'm from January 2020, cumulating my shocks going forward. Uh, so just put that in, in your head because that's that's important to read the chart. Uh, but as that initial uh, real shock hit, you can see the economy remained quite depressed for a while through much of 2020 uh, and only towards the end of 2020. Uh, you can see these real shocks started to unwind, right? This orange bar started to get uh, smaller. But uh, a very important uh, sort of uh, other driver of these lower yields uh, was reaction shocks. So, right, uh, the market perceiving the Fed as being significantly more dovish uh, over this period. Obviously, initially when the shock hits, the market probably perceives the Fed to be pretty uh, neutral, not necessarily more hawkish or dovish relative to its expectations. But by the time the Fed introduces what it calls flexible average inflation targeting, this was uh, a change in basically the operational, um, um, uh, the uh, operational framework of the Fed. You can see these reaction shocks and the market's perception of the Fed uh, turns significantly dovish. 
And even as the economy improves, these re reaction shocks tend to get larger and larger over 2020 and 2021. Uh, and even into, uh, into the latter part of 2021, uh, you can see these um, reaction shocks are very negative, even though the real economy is improving, right? And even though you're starting to see these positive inflation shocks. Uh, and by June 2021, inflation in the U.S. was already at 4%. That's double the inflation target of the Fed. Uh, and so lots of people started talking about the Fed being behind the curve in raising interest rates. Uh, and this is uh, one reflection of at least how the market perceived the Fed over much of this period. Of course, in 2022, things turned around uh, quite quickly. And the Fed had to, as I showed you in those earlier charts, significantly increase interest rates. Um, and uh, increasing uh, the Fed funds rate by something like 75 basis points at a single time. That's a type of increase we haven't seen in, in decades that the Fed do. Uh, and so that um, sort of reverse of interest rates and significant increase in interest rates uh, that we saw, again, was a function of uh, the Fed rapidly increasing interest rates, the market perceiving the Fed as becoming significantly hawkish, uh, and focusing on its uh, inflation mandate um, over this period. So you can see these blue bars became quite large uh, and also occurred in the context of these sort of better economic outlook, the, the orange bars, as well as uh, higher inflation um, over this period. Uh, so let's put that into context. The left chart tries to put that into context, how the 2022 hiking cycle compared to other hiking cycles that we saw in the Fed uh, undertake over the decades. Uh, and of course, um, the 2022 one was one of the fast, uh, steepest and fastest hiking cycles in nearly four decades. Uh, and uh, this hiking cycle was also different in other ways to uh, the substantial hiking that occurred in 2004 or 1994 or 1987. Uh, and what you can see in this chart is that the previous hiking cycles uh, were mainly driven by these real and inflation shocks, right? These blue bars were a part of it. Uh, there was this perception of a hawkish shift in the Fed, but not as much as uh, what we saw in the 2022 uh, hiking cycle. So the 2022 hiking cycle that the Fed undertook was very different. Uh, it was um, very different from previous hiking cycles. Uh, and a big part of what that was this hockey shift, this big reaction shock. Uh, and then one other thing that's quite different about the 2022 cycle versus other cycles is really the uncertainty that you see around these two year hills uh, is higher than in prior cases. Right. So people's um, people's ability to know what the Fed is going to do or to. Uh, know the path of interest rates was less clear in the 2022 case than in previous cases. Of course, then what we want to know is how these inflation real and reaction shocks affected emerging markets and developing economies. And just to preview the next question, that right-hand chart gives you uh, the sovereign spreads that are changes that are happening in emerging markets and developing economies in 2022 and 2023. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing that we saw is that sovereign risk spreads uh, deteriorated significantly in uh, developing countries with uh, weak credit ratings, right? Those with high debt, with uh, 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 non-investment grade, um, debt saw substantial increases in sovereign risk spreads, um, where moderate and strong credit rating saw significantly less. And this is a 12 percentage point move in your sovereign risk spread, right? A 12 percentage point move in your hard currency uh, debt, uh, the price of that hard currency debt, right? U.S. dollar debt. So now moving to the second question, how do different types of shocks affect emerging markets, uh, financial markets, um, capital flows, borrowing costs, and fiscal outcomes? And um, since it's a different question, we have a different method. And in this case, we are using those real 
reaction and inflation shocks to look at in a panel local projection model uh, how uh, these uh, developing economy variables are going to be changing. Uh, and so this regression just basically shows that we're going to be controlling for a bunch of other factors in these economies like real GDP, inflation, debt, capital flows, interest rates, and exchange rates. Uh, and we're going to do this in a panel setting. So we're going to basically bring all the, all the emerging markets and developing economies together in one model. And we're going to try to use uh, all that information together to try to identify if the Fed increases interest rates as a consequence of reaction shocks, what happens in developing countries. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using quarterly data from 1997 to about 2020, 2019. So we're dropping the global financial crisis. We're dropping COVID because we don't want our models to be uh, biased by those uh, very big outlier events. And I'll show you, we've extended this to a nonlinear setting as well, uh, really to look at investment versus non-investment grade uh, EMDEs. So what kind of reactions do you get in response to these shocks in emerging markets? So this first chart, uh, we're gonna talk about the, the interest rates uh, in emerging markets. And so you can see we've got the three month uh, interest rates in these countries, 10 year yields, as well as the EMBI plus, that's the sovereign risk spread, right? The spread over US dollar bonds that uh, emerging markets are paying on hard currency debt, so dollar debt, basically. And you can see oh, that is happening over these three shocks. And so what I want to point you to is the right part of this chart is really how um, EMDs are responding to reaction shocks. Uh, their, their, their interest rates are responding to these reaction shocks. So in this, in this uh, um, figure, we're showing a 25 basis point shock to US interest rates driven by reaction by these shocks. Uh, and uh, what you can quite clearly see is that 10 year yields are probably moving about one to one uh, as a consequence of the shift of the 25 basis point increase that you see in the US. Uh, developing countries see about a one to one increase in their local currency 10-year yields as well. But what you can also see is a more than one increase in its sovereign risk spread, right? So I think it's a, a, about a 1.5, a 35 basis point increase uh, as a consequence uh, of a Fed 25 basis point increase. Uh, so when US interest rates move, emerging markets interest rates are also moving. Uh, so that's the, the most important shock in this context. The other one we, we're finding quite interesting results on is really this real shock, right? This is when you get an increase in interest rates driven by real shock. That's the perception of better uh, growth prospects in the U.S. And in, in that case, you can see that the interest rates also rise. The 10-year yields also rise in these emerging markets. Uh, I'm showing this is the first quarter response. So right after the shock, the first quarter response after that shock. Uh, so you get about a less than one to one increase in uh, in local currency bond yields. Uh, but interestingly enough, the sort of risk uh, uh, perspective on emerging markets in response to these real shocks is actually decreasing. So their sovereign spreads are improving uh, in the context of this better uh, sort of outlook for the U.S. Fed. And I'm going to skip the inflation shock here um, for now. The other, th uh, So this chart then shows you the exact same thing we saw earlier around the reaction shocks, right? The 10-year uh, and sovereign risk spreads moves in response to these 25 base point reaction shocks. Uh, but what I want to show you is how that compares if you go into sort of a nonlinear world and you look at investment grade emerging markets versus non-investment grade uh, emerging markets. And there quite clearly you can see um, the response uh, that we are averaging in the case of the left chart and you saw earlier uh, reflects this sort of non-linear uh, larger response of non-investment grade EMDE. So when the Fed increases 
uh, by 25 basis or when two year yields increase by 25 basis points in, uh, in response to a reaction shock, you get a doubling of local currency, 10 year local currency hit, uh, bond yields in non-investment grade EMDEs uh, and a similar doubling of their sovereign risk spreads. Uh, and you get less of a reaction, uh, less than one to one uh, reaction in the case uh, of investment grade um, EMDs. So basically countries with better credit ratings are responding uh, more or, or facing less, uh, less costly debt in response to these uh, shocks than those with investment grade. So it pays to be uh, a prudent uh, developing country, to run prudent policy, to have low debt, uh, to be an investment grade, uh, to have investment grade debt. <coughs> uh, next, let's look at how capital flows, exchange rates and equity prices respond. Uh, and again, let's focus on that right three bars and what you can see in response to a reaction shock, again, 25 basis points, is that capital flows uh, uh, out of emerging uh, market, markets in response to this shock. So it's really a risk off type shock for these economies. Uh, their exchange rates uh, depreciate and their equity prices decrease, right? So when these orange bars are off zero and don't include zero, we're saying there's a statistically significant response. Uh, and interestingly enough, equity prices are not responding statistically in this case. Uh, a bit of an odd response because you would imagine that equity prices respond uh, and decrease uh, in response. Uh, again, let's compare that to the real shock, right? Um, in the case of the real shock, uh, really, uh, emerging markets are not suffering. So if interest rates in the U.S. are rising because of those real shocks, uh, these emerging markets are actually benefiting, right? They're seeing an appreciation uh, of their currency and they're seeing better cap, uh, better equity price outcomes uh, and uh, sort of increase in capital flows, but again, not statistically significant. Um, so that contrast between real and reaction shocks is important, right? Previous hiking cycles, it's more reflection of uh, that the Fed undertook that we saw in that uh, earlier chart in the uh, you know 1994, for example. Uh, conditions were improving in the U.S. economy. This was good uh, in many ways for emerging markets, uh, and uh, their response to that increase. Uh, there are positive aspects of their response to that increase in interest rates. Whereas if it's driven by reaction shock, these countries are going to be suffering. They're going to face higher borrowing costs. They're going to face capital outflows. They're going to face depreciation in their currency. They're going to face um, decreases in equity prices. What does it mean for economic growth? Uh, sorry, these charts are a bit full. But let's look at that left chart uh, and look at sort of the components of GDP. Uh, and look at these red bars. I think the most important thing to see here is when interest rates rise because of a reaction shocks, uh, you see private consumption and fixed investment in these economies deteriorate, right? They decrease. Whereas when it's a real shock driving up interest rates, uh, although the overall GDP response is not significant, you can see exports are rising, right? Better U.S. outcomes means more demand for emerging market exports, and hence you see that rise in exports as a consequence of these real shocks. Uh, and then finally, on the uh, inflation sort of picture profile of emerging markets in response to these shocks, you can see that inflation shocks are very inflationary in emerging markets as well. Uh, these reaction shocks, which are decreasing U.S. inflation, uh, are similarly decreasing uh, inflation in emerging markets. So uh, uh, possibly driving, um, driven by the lower inflation in the US. Uh, and then also in the case of the real shocks, you see because of the appreciation of the currency, um, lower inflation.
What happens to, uh, so how do uh, emerging markets fiscal policy respond? Uh, so what's happening to debt and fiscal balances? Uh, so again, what you can see overall uh, throughout these uh, shocks on the right-hand chart, uh, no matter what kind of shock you're talking about, debt seems to be decreasing uh, in all cases, not statistically significant in the inflation reaction shocks. But in terms of better economic outcomes, you're seeing uh, debt levels decrease and significantly decrease uh, in emerging markets. And that's really being driven by the response of the fiscal balance. So what uh, governments are doing on the fiscal side on expenditure and revenue. Uh, and you can see uh, the fiscal balance is improving. So either a deficit is getting smaller or a deficit is turning into a surplus or a surplus is getting larger, right? Uh, less spending, more revenue. Uh, and that's what you can see there in that real shock. I'm gonna skip this uh, because it's just on the sort of components, uh, like how debt, uh, different debt components are, are driving or moving in response to into the, uh, that debt. So uh, let's move on to the, to the last question, which is how do different types of shocks affect the likelihood of financial crisis? So to try to answer this question, we're gonna uh, again use a different model, which is a logit low low or probit model. Uh, we're following previous literature in this case. And really what we're looking at is uh, how sort of the probability of a banking, currency, or sovereign debt crisis changes uh, in response to these real inflation uh, and reaction shocks. We're going to be, again, running this in a panel setting on annual data from 1985 to 2018. And we're going to add a bunch of control variables to this. So we're going to say that these crises can uh, be driven by changes in GDP growth, in the level of short-term debt, in private debt, and government debt, debt service costs, among other variables, right? Uh, and so then the question is, how is the uh, real inflation and reaction shocks uh, driven uh, by this outcome? So we have uh, limited information in terms of uh, how interest rates affect uh, sort of the probability, US interest rate moves affect the probability um, of crisis in emerging markets. This COSA and L paper, which we're basing our model on, basically shows that a um, that about a two percentage point increase in U.S. real interest rates, uh, which is about a half of this the cumulative increase you see in the typical hiking cycle in the U.S., increases the probability of a currency crisis from about four point one percent to about. 6%. So that's the kind of context we're thinking about. Uh, how are these shocks going to be increasing the probability of crisis uh, in, in the EMDEs? So just for a little context, uh, we're using Levine and Valencia. They, of course, were relying on other literature uh, that's already sort of identified these banking currency and sovereign debt crises. And on the chart on the left, you can see um, the sort of count of these crises events happening in emerging markets. Uh, and you can see again, uh, sort of the peaks in the 1980s, you had lots of sovereign debt crises. In the 1990s, again, you had a lot of banking and sovereign debt crises in emerging uh, markets. 1999, you had the Asian financial crisis. And then I guess you go into a period of great moderation and you see significantly less crises in these, uh, in these economies. Uh, but quite interestingly, this data only goes to 2018, but if you were to sort of identify and think about a currency crisis based on this Levine and Valencia methodology, you can see 2022 reflects a significant increase in the number of emerging markets facing a currency crisis. And the currency crisis is defined as basically a 30 percentage point move, depreciation uh, in, uh, in emerging markets uh, currency. So what do we find in our uh, probit model? Uh, 
or in this case, sorry, the logit model is the benchmark model we use in the end. In the paper, we have uh, a few different models. Um, this is one I'll show you here. I'm just going to show you again the real inflation and reaction shocks uh, across these three different crises, types of crises. And then again, uh, what we call an any crisis sort of variable, which is all three crises kind of thrown into one regression. And again, what's quite interesting is these reaction shocks are really what's important uh, and what explain uh, a significant increase in the likelihood of a crisis happening uh, in um, developing countries, and it's specifically a currency crisis. So you can see that that coefficient is uh, positive and significant, and uh, we don't have to interpret these coefficients because they're uh, a bit uh, tough to, uh, to interpret. So we'll just uh, translate that into what the likelihood of a crisis looks like uh, in these economies. Uh, and, and what you can see here is that on average in an EMDE, the probability of a, of a country facing a crisis is probably about three and a half percent, right? So that's what you see kind of in those bars that at the zero, that's kind of like the baseline probability of a crisis happening uh, in emerging markets. And then what we do is we show how if these real inflation or reaction shocks were to increase, uh, right from zero to 25 basis points or 50 basis points. Uh, here we're just showing it as 0.25%. Um, how the probability of crisis uh, is going to re respond. And this is the any crisis case. So you can see, I see I'm running close to the end of my 40 minutes. So let me, uh, I've got a few more slides and I'll finish up. But the important part of this chart is really that it's the reaction shocks that you can see are leading to an increase in the probability of crisis. So a 50 basis point increase in interest rates driven by a reaction shock um, is more than doubling your probability of facing a uh, crisis. So what does that look like in terms of the increase we saw in 2022? So in 2022, we saw reaction shocks increase by about 140 basis points. And so this chart gives you a sense of the likelihood of these crises in response to that 140 basis points increase. So you can see debt, sovereign debt crises, the probability of that happening is low, uh, always remains low, uh, is not responding to any of these shocks. There's definitely something else driving the likelihood of those crises. Banking crises, we can't really say anything, not statistically significant. Probability is a bit higher, but there's lots of uncertainty in how we can measure that probability. But importantly, what we can see is the currency crisis risk significantly increases. Uh, and in response to that uh, size of shock, reaction shock, um, you know, the probability is it's effectively above uh, 50 percent that these uh, that countries will face a currency crisis. Of course, uh, this period is quite interesting because emerging markets did pretty well coming out of the COVID crisis and did pretty well relative to expectations uh, of the Fed. So I asked these three questions, um, sort of how real inflation reaction shocks drove outcomes in the U.S. And you could see really that 2022 crisis was really about reaction shocks, right? And very different from what we saw in the past. So that's the main message from that. How do these different shocks affect EMDEs? I think the important message there is really real shocks can be benign uh, and not uh, you know, benign for emerging markets and not necessarily leading to uh, more sovereign risk, not leading to capital outflows, could be good for exports and so on. Whereas reaction shocks can be pretty adverse uh, to emerging markets. So it matters what is driving interest rates higher in the US. And then finally, I just showed you the likelihood of crisis. And there the story really seems to be around currency crisis and reaction shocks driving currency crisis. And there I will uh, end. And thank you very much uh, for your, your attention.